Good to be back with you um, and to see so many familiar faces. Lovely. I, I dare say old faces because uh, <laughs> I should get in trouble for my wife. But we're going to start by singing, O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name. found out that one of the benefits of what we're going through at the moment is that when I go around preaching, um, I can choose hymns that perhaps people are not so familiar with because they're being played over that. <laughs> and uh, so no one feels embarrassed if they don't know the words or the tune. Uh, they can just uh, hum along or sing along and they, they actually learn a new song. Uh, I must admit it's one of my favourites from many years ago uh, and it's, uh, but I, I still could not remember how it started um, but so it was good to have it uh, played uh, this morning like that and knew the chorus well but um, you know uh, we will magnify, we will magnify the Lord in Zion so let's pray together our loving Heavenly Father we want to thank you that we are able to come together, whether it's here in the church or whether it's watching on Zoom 
or maybe looking at it later on, we're able to be together because the one person who unites us is you. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are present with us whether we're in our homes or whether we're in the church here. And we pray, Lord, that we will know your presence really with us today, that we will hear from you. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the way that the vaccination programme is working out in this country. So many people being vaccinated now and we thank you for that. But Lord, we are mindful in many parts of the world the COVID-19 is rampant and we think particularly of India at this time. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in your goodness, in your mercy, you will come into that country, that you will give the leaders of that country wisdom as to know how to deal with the pandemic, will know how to reduce the number of people who are uh, wanting to go to hospital, or that that provide more oxygen. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will work in that nation. And through you working, Lord, there will be a real turning around to you. Heavenly Father, we continue to remember the royal family before you. We pray for our Queen. We thank you for her. We thank you for the members of the royal family who love you. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them at this time of continued sadness because it does take a long time, if ever, to recover from losing someone who you've been married to uh, for over 70 years. Lord, we thank you for the longevity of that marriage and we thank you for the way in which they supported each other. We now pray that the Queen will continue to look to you for support and help each day and that other members of the family will also help. Lord, we pray for the churches in our country. We've had a report out in the last week saying that it has institutional racism. We pray, Lord, that you would overrule and you would speak to people, that we will accept each other as we are. Heavenly Father, it doesn't matter whether we have what colour our skin is. You love us and we should love one another. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together as a group of your people and it doesn't matter what we look like, what we sound like, uh, but Lord, we just thank you that we're able to come into your presence and you welcome us. So, Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that we will once again be conscious of you being here and that we will listen to what you're saying to us because we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I love the continuation. (laughs) That's great, you know, um, because uh, there are so many different prayers Tied up in that one prayer, so we were saying amen to all of them. (laughs) Um, Let's uh, sing again. This time, um, Jesus is King and I will extol him, give him the glory.
Samuel chapter 5. Uh, the title is Jesus, sorry, David becomes king over Israel. Jesus is already king. <laughs> so he didn't need to become. So uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaign. And the Lord said to you, you shall, be sh- you shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron, before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months and in Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You are not getting here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Now Hiram king of Tyre sent messengers to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons and they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem and more sons and daughters were born to him. These are the names of the children born to him there. Shammah, Shobah, Nathan, Solomon, Abiha, Elishu, Nepheg, Jephiah, Elishama, Elida and Eliphalet. And when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Baal Parazim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there and David and his men carried them off. Once more the Philistines came up and spread out over the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord and he answered, 
do not go straight up but circle round behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the rocks of the balsam trees, move quickly because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Giza. And excuse the pronunciation of some of those names. But you know who I meant. Before we look at that passage, we're going to sing once more, and this one is, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God Who sits upon the throne And unto the Lamb Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks Honor and power and strength to look into the words we have read from the Bible this morning. Help us to understand them. Help us to put them into practice in our lives, those things you want to teach us. And may we go away knowing that it is being good to be in your presence this morning through what you have said to each one of us. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. 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 David had waited a long time for this chapter to occur, for this incident to occur. By my reckoning, I think it's probably about 15 years or so. Could have been a bit longer, could have been a bit shorter, but at least somewhere around about there because he was a teenager when uh, God spoke to him and Samuel anointed him as king in 1 Samuel 16 and here he is 30 years old uh, when he becomes king. So he'd waited a good long time. Um, I don't think it's quite as long as Prince Charles to be fair. (laughs) But, um, you know, he knew that he had been chosen to be king and During all those years, Saul had been the king and Saul had persecuted him. And I can just imagine, if it had been me, it would have been going through my mind, God, have you got this right? You know, am I supposed to be king? 
why is Saul still king if you, you know, anointed me as king? It's just not, just doesn't seem right, waiting all this time. So, I suspect there may have been a bit of frustration, there may have been a bit of anger, there may have been a bit of, well, when's it going to happen? But here now, we find in this passage, there are five things in those first five verses. There's an awful lot we can take out of this chapter which, you know, if we went through it carefully we would be here to the middle of the afternoon but you're not going to be. So you can take comfort from that. Um, Five things to note. When the time did come for David to become king he didn't say, it's me. He waited for the people of Israel to come to him, to make him king. He didn't take it upon himself. I wonder, is there a lesson there for us? Do we put ourselves forward because I'm the best person for the job? Or do we wait to be asked? because someone else actually can see in you that you are, yeah, you are the best person for the job. But rather than put yourself forward, someone comes and asks you. And are you willing then to take on the job? Secondly, he was an Israelite. He wasn't a foreigner. He wasn't someone from another nation. He was actually someone from a particular family because it fitted into the genealogy of Jesus right the way through from Adam up through to Jesus and we find David whether you go through uh, Joseph's genealogy or whether you go through Mary's genealogy David is there and I was thinking you know our church leaders should not be foreigners and what do I mean by that? I don't mean that they shouldn't be African, they shouldn't be Asian. I'm meaning they should be believers. Not foreign to the gospel message. Not foreign to God's word. Not foreigners in that sense. So he was an Israelite, not a foreigner. Thirdly, he had proved himself in battle. They said whenever Saul went to battle, you were always at the front leading us. You were the one who led. He led by example as he led from the front. And church leaders should not, should be people who have proved themselves as it's either Timothy or Titus that says they should not be novices. They should have proved that they know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. They should prove that they are willing and able to lead. Number four, and I think probably the most important reason that the people chose David as king and that David was chosen as king was because God had chosen him. Because they said, and the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and you shall become their ruler. The people knew that God had chosen David. And it is so important that church leaders today should be those who are chosen by God. I've already said, not self-appointed, but chosen by God. They put the Lord first in everything. I think that to be a church leader, they were talking to someone on the radio this morning about it is a vocation to be a church leader because it is a 24-7 job. As I'm sure the leaders here will testify to, And as I found out, you know, you get a phone call at just about midnight, someone's on Beachy Head, can you come from your church congregation? Um, And you are 24-7 
available because that's what a church leader is there for. The final thing, number five, was that David ruled over Israel and Judah. The two sections had been divided but David brought them together and there was unity. He brought unity to the nation of Israel and it wasn't then Israel and Judah, it was Israel that they were called. Church leaders should bring unity, not division. It doesn't mean that church leaders can't change things just because one or two people don't agree with it but a church leader tries to get alongside people and tries to bring everybody along with them. Before my time at Horham, the uh, chapel used to be in Maynard's Green and it used to be called the Gospel Hall and uh, it was there for over a hundred years and they got the call to move from Maynard's Green a mile up the road into the busier town of Horham or the busier village of Horham should I say and they took the church with them apart from one person and I felt that that was a real testimony because it was for lots of people it was a massive change from what they'd been used to one person just went off but the rest all came. They didn't always agree, but they worked together. And now what, for 25 years it's been in the centre of the village of Forum. Uh, so that's over 125 years of witness in that place. So bringing unity, not division. But to unite the nation, we find that David in verses 6 through to 15 had to defeat or capture Jerusalem which was going to be the, his city. And we find that the king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites. The men trusted David and went with him. But those in Jerusalem thought they, it was impregnable. We are not going to get defeated. You will never get in here. Even the blind and the lame will stop you. Uh, because it's just not going to happen. And I love this because uh, it just says David captured the fortress of Zion. We're not told how. We may be able to have an educated guess but we're not actually physically told in the Bible how he did it. It's just he did. And he made it the city of David. And today we have so many people uh, trying to find out the beginnings of creation. The Bible tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it doesn't tell us how. Now that could be a little bit frustrating for some people, but for me, I just find it, wow, you know, God created all of this. And I do get a little bit annoyed when I hear of all these going off into space and spending all this money trying to find out the meaning or the, the start of life somewhere. Why? God created the heavens and the earth and he doesn't tell us how, he just tells us he did. And we accept that, I trust, by faith. So through endurance, we've got three E's here, through endurance David became king and conquered Jerusalem. He had to endure a lot, didn't he, the previous seven years until he came up to Jerusalem he had to endure a lot through Saul but are we, do we endure all that comes before us in other words are we patient and I'm not 
I really struggle with patience. My prayer is, Lord, give me patience, but give it to me quick. And I really find that enduring is not easy. But then David was established as king over Israel. And David recognises that this is not his doing. He says that it is God who has done this. And God's doing. Do we give God the praise for what he has done and what he is doing in our lives? And then David was exalted by God, not for David's sake, but for the sake of God's kingdom. Because God saw in David this one man who would lead his people, the Jews, would restore all the territory, would defeat the Philistines and all the armies around them and he would be exalted because we're told and David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Do you recognise that God is using you? He's actually using you to establish his kingdom. God wants you to praise him. And we just thank him this morning that he has established in this place a group of his followers. And he's going to exalt you. Not because you're better than anybody else in Chaley or the surrounding area, but because he wants to establish his kingdom here. He wants to exalt his kingdom in this place. Ah. And we come now to the final section, 17 to 25. And David's perennial enemy, the Philistines, were going to attack. Well, David didn't avoid the issue. He confronted the Philistines, but first he asked the Lord, What shall I do? Will you defeat the Philistines if I go up and attack? And isn't it wonderful when we get that immediate answer to prayer? David got that immediate answer. Yes, go and I will give the Philistines into your hand. I will defeat them. But I think we all know that God doesn't always answer our prayers like that straight away. Sometimes it can take years, can't it? But God is there. It's great to know that God was with him but then he had to put that faith into action and the Philistine army was a lot bigger than David's army and yes God had told him yeah go and I will defeat them but putting that faith into action took courage putting your faith my faith into action sometimes takes courage believing that God will defeat the enemy. And we give God the credit and God, uh, David gave God the credit and in verse 21 the Philistines abandoned their idols there and David and his men carried them off. I think if you were to look in comparable passage in 1 Chronicles 14 and verse 12 he didn't just carry them off he burnt the idols which is a bit different to what some of the kings did, they kept them and they became idols of their own but David didn't do that he got rid of the idols but then the Philistines decide we'll attack again before David gets too established we will attack again 
Now, I suspect if it had been me, I would have thought, right, okay, Lord, I'm going to attack. You said you're going to be with me last time. I'm assuming you're going to be with me this time. I'll go and attack. But he didn't. He asked the question again. Should I go? Now, whether he, in his history books he'd read about uh, Jericho and then Ai, where the people didn't ask God about attacking Ai and they got defeated and they had to come back to the Lord. David asked again because he needed to know, he didn't take it for granted. How often do you and I take things for granted? We're very good at doing that, aren't we? But he didn't. And God said, yes, but this time you're going to do it differently. I want you to go and circle behind them. And then when you hear the wind blowing through the balsam trees, that's when you know I've gone before you and have attacked and defeated the Philistines. That's when you quickly go and attack. And they did, and the Philistines were defeated. And God again shows just how powerful he is. But isn't that the difference between Saul and David? Saul was told to wait, and he didn't. David was told, wait until you hear the wind, and then attack. And he obeyed difference between those two things. Let's just think, God has used different tactics throughout the ages to pass on his message. He's used preachers who've gone around on horseback. I think of the Wesley brothers and people like that. He's used people like Billy Graham to stand up in front of thousands of people. He's used a single preacher who turned up and there was nobody there. But he thought, okay, I've been asked to preach, so he stood up and he preached. Little did he know there was an electrician working in the back. True story, who became a Christian because he believed it was right to preach to an empty church. God uses so many different ways of reaching people. Back in the uh, 1800s, late 1800s, he used Sunday schools, didn't he? They were started. What's he using now? Well, you still get the occasional Sunday school, but it's more messy church now, isn't it? Things have moved on and changed. God still is working and he uses that. We've seen the past year how God has used Zoom. I haven't gone Zoom way. I have to confess, I don't understand it, I don't use it, but I can see just how much God has used Zoom to reach so many people. He has used so many different ways. My brother, who is a Baptist minister uh, just outside Kettering now, said, I've never had so many people listen to a sermon of mine before. He's getting over a hundred people every Sunday. He only gets a congregation of about 40. Uh, He says, there are over a hundred listening to my sermons every week. It's amazing how God, and that's through YouTube, that's not through Zoom, that's through YouTube. Um, And God is using, if we are prepared to let him, Are we prepared to use those different ways of using people for the Lord? Have we spent time before the Lord asking him, how do you want me to preach this Sunday? Or how do you want me to pass on the message in this place over the next year? Do we say, oh well, we'll just do the same as we've done before? Or is God giving us the opportunity at the moment to say, all right, let's rethink and say, 
No, it's not a full-on attack. I want you to come behind. Ah. When you hear the wind, I want you to... That's when I want you to move. Ah. And you know that applies ah. not just to church services, but it's the whole of church life. Whether it's the service, the day, the time... I ask the question, is church life going to go back to normal in inverted commas or will it, will there be God inspired changes? I'm so glad that people can watch this on Zoom this morning as well as being together as a group of people. Ah. And um, Martin Paul who is uh, a vicar in Brighton was asked this morning, because his church has opened up again, and they said, are you still doing Zoom? He said, oh yes, I'm hoping we will still be able to do that forever. Because it's reaching people that I can't normally reach. Are we prepared to do and use God and what God is saying to us at this particular time to move in a particular way? It may not always be this way, but he may change way in which the message never changes. Let me emphasise that. The message never changes, but the way which, which we pass it on can change. And finally, through this chapter, we see a picture of Jesus, the king chosen by God, who had to go through persecution for us to save his people, you and me, from sin. And I could, I know Jesus would ne- it wouldn't have even entered his thought, but if I had been Jesus, maybe I'd have been thinking, have you got it right, Lord? Do I need to go to the cross? Do I need, to- surely you can do it some other way. He has been established as King of Kings. He opens the eyes of the disciples to understand the scriptures, Luke 24 and may he open our eyes this morning as to what he wants us to do in the future. Let's pray. A loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this chapter this morning which has brought to life what David had to go through but also has challenged us, Lord, as to what we need to be thinking about how we need to be moving on in the future. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would guide the leaders in this church here. We pray, Lord, that you would guide each person in this church to know what you want them to be doing. We pray, Lord, that you would use your people in this place to establish your kingdom so that, Lord, you will be exalted in this area. Heavenly Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would work in whatever way you want him to work so that we are listening and are willing to put our faith into action. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn just sums up, if you like, of what God is to us. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be.
may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.